just like Jackie told you, I'm Tanya Janka, and I want to talk to you about building security champions. So I say I worded that really specifically for a reason, um, not just because it's an OWASP conference and they always have a builder's track, but because you don't just get security champions from anywhere. You really have to build them up into becoming champions. Because if someone's already on the security team, they're already an advocate, they're already interested, they're already, in my, if they're me, they're obsessed with security. But if you are trying to attract people to become a champion for you, I believe we need to build them up into that spot so that, first of all, they own that position, they're awesome at it, they know what they're doing, but also so they feel built up and powerful and empowered and knowledgeable and ready to do the job. And we're going to talk about security champions because we want to talk about how to scale our security programs and our teams. But actually, let me just tell you the way that I'm going to tell you. So I like to tell you what I'm going to tell you, then I tell you, then I tell you what I told you because I want you to leave here and be knowledgeable on the topic of security champions. If you already are knowledgeable about that, then I want you instead to have a ton of good ideas to go back to your office with to do with your champions. So I want to talk about scaling our security team and scaling our security program. And by that, I don't mean hiring 25 more people because that's really hard to do right now, not just financially, but just actually finding them and attracting them and keeping them. I also want to talk about what the heck I mean by a security champion and how we can build them up into awesome advocates for our program. So throughout this entire session, we are going to follow a recipe that I made up partially because I've just worked with so many companies over security champions in a consulting fashion and then also like built my own program. So I know also I've just like every time I see an article or talk about it, I have to watch it or read it because I always want to know how to do this better because I found this really powerful. Okay, so the first thing we do is recruit people and we're going to explore each one of these. I'm just telling you the recipe in advance so that you know what's coming. So we're going to recruit people. We're going to engage them and get them interested. We're going to teach them all the stuff they need to know. We're going to make sure we recognize and reward them so they, first of all, feel good about what they're doing and also want to keep doing it. And then most important, we are not going to stop. So this is uh, the, the biggest problem I see with Security Champions program is they start out hot, fast, energetic, like a sprinter. Um, but then it turns out it's not a sprint. It's actually a marathon and it's better to go slow and steady and be consistent. If you want to, I guess we're not finishing the race. Do you know what I mean? Like you want to keep going and keep going and keep going. And so we're going to talk about some tricks for that. So as you heard, I'm Tanya. I'm the CEO and founder of We Hack Purple. I'm known as She Hacks Purple on the internet. And I actually do have a little bit of purple in my hair, but I cut a lot off. And so I have to fix that, obviously. Um, I wrote a book and I've been in tech a long time. And I try to, I like, I volunteer a lot. Um, and basically, I am a nerd on the internet. That's the main focus of this slide. Tanya's a nerd and she's on the internet. <laughs> and speakers do this slide because we want you to know about us and know and hopefully feel confident. You know, this person seems to know what they're doing. It is worth sitting through this talk. I hope that you're at home. Where I am right now, it is raining and dark and it's just kind of chilly. So. I have some slippers on, I'm nice and warm, I'm totally going to have some hot chocolate after this, so I hope you are like nice and cozy and comfortable wherever you are, and you're ready to sit in on this with me. And also put questions in the chat. Okay, so the problem. So I'm one of those people where I don't like talks where they just describe lots of problems and they don't have solutions. So I'm always like, here's the problem, I'm gonna give you 5% of my talk time. And then 95% is how do we solve this problem? So if you are at an OWASP conference or if you just work in IT, you're probably well aware there's not enough security professionals to do all the jobs. And I always focus on application security because I was a dev uh, until around seven, or I'm losing track of how many years ago when I switched over full-time into security. I was interested in it, I was learning more about it, I joined the OWASP meetup, I was doing the things, reading the books, podcasts, all the stuff, 
And then one day I took the jump. And by that I mean I, I begged and begged and begged the security team until they agreed that I could join. <laughs> Um, I make it sound like it was like this decisive decision. It was more like I was trying a really long time and then it worked. But there's not enough security professionals to do all of the jobs. There's just not. And like it's a problem. And because we know there's not enough to go around, we try to scale our team. And there's a lot of different ways you could scale, like through automation. And I always like, I mean, I am a computer nerd. So I, I literally want to automate everything. I have a a giant garden and I've automated the watering and I've automated some lights if it's a rainy day and all this stuff because that's what I'm like so automating you know doing coaching um, having interns like there's a lot of different ways that you can try to make your program scale but one of the ways that I've seen work and one of the ways that I find can change a security culture overall so it's not just that it scales my team but it scales my program and that's why I scale and so the one we're going to talk about today is security champions specifically so here is a super formal definition that you can find on Wikipedia except for I made it nicer so a security champion is a member of a team that takes on the responsibility of acting as the primary advocate for security within their own team and acting as a first line of defense for security issues within the team. But let's say that again in plain English. They're the person who's super excited. They're pumped up. They read the book. They fix the bug. They watch the video. They show up to the stream. They go to all your lunch and learns. They ask all the questions. They're emailing you. They swing by your desk. They talk to you on whatever chat program. That person that is the person that you want to be your security champion. If you're ignoring those people, mm -mm, that person is your new best friend. So what is a security champion? Like, what does Tanya mean by this? Like, it's nice you have some words, put them on the screen, explain it to me so that I can actually picture it in my mind. So a security champion is your communicator. They deliver messages from the security team to the dev team. And this can apply, like you can have people on the finance team that are security champions, you just teach them different things. And I just realized I'm feeling like a little short. It's gonna like up my chair a bit, there we go. Now I'm taller. Um, <laughs> they deliver messages, they share, they teach, and they help. So they might be the person that's in charge of your SaaS tool and use it all the time and they fix all the bugs around it. or. They triage the results and then, you know, give out the bugs to the rest of the team. They are the person on the team that is basically the contact for security. Oh, does that bring me to the next bullet point? Yes, it does. So they're your contact. So they deliver messages to the security team. So they keep you up to date on what's important. They tell you when there's problems. They ask for help, which is super important because if they aren't asking you for help, do you know who they're asking? They're asking Stack Overflow and Stack Overflow is telling them the worst possible answer, I assure you. Um, they are your advocate. So they perform security work for their team, but with your help, but more importantly, they advocate on behalf of security. So I'm gonna get a bit more into what advocacy means or being an advocate, but basically, Imagine I'm the security person and I come to your team and I go to talk to you and I'm like, blah, 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 I want you to fix this and that and I found lots of bugs and I need you to fix it all yesterday. And you're like, gosh, she's, that's not helpful. I'm not enjoying this discussion. But imagine it's a person on your team who's in the cubicle next to you who you trust and you've worked with for a few years. And they say, hey, so I ran this thing and it, ooh, it lit up like a Christmas tree. I'm kind of concerned. Can we take a look together and try to split these up and maybe we can make it less embarrassing by the time the security team sees it. When a peer asks you to do something or brings something to your attention or reminds you, it's very different than when someone from another team does that. Especially, I don't know if you know, but the security team doesn't always have a great rep everywhere. I definitely, when I was a dev, I remember thinking, how inappropriate would it be if I crawled under my desk so they didn't see me? <laughs> If I get caught, how embarrassing is it versus potentially missing them? <laughs> and so having them advocate for you is huge. So I want us to build 
security champions. I want us to build them up. And so let's start the recipe. Okay, so first we're gonna recruit. So yeah, I like, I like the idea of like the big muscle, like yeah, let's recruit our champions. But basically, we are going to try to draw them in and attract them. So first rule, most important rule, number one, don't volunteer or order or force someone to become a champion. Attract people instead. And I know you're thinking like, oh, that's easier said than done. Yeah, I know it's more work. It is more work to do a good job. <laughs> it's really easy to do a bad job of things. Trust me, I know you should see some home renovations I've done. But <laughs> if you want to do a good job and you want to get good results, you want to attract people who are actually interested, actually passionate, who have time, who want to learn. And when you force someone like, oh, Bob was late to the meeting, ha ha, he has to be the security champion. That's not gonna be your best champion, let me tell you. The second most important rule for recruiting is ensuring that their manager is on board. Because if they won't give them time to do this work and they find it annoying that they're doing it or they're trying to discourage them, again, you're not going to get the best work you can. And on top of that, your champion's going to feel really conflicted. If you're like, hey, do you have time this week that we could um, you know, get together and go over like what your team's are working on? But meanwhile, their manager is like, I need you to stop wasting so much time. Like, you know, with the security team, it's, it's incongruent. And so if you are seeing this where you have managers that aren't on board, you need to persuade the manager and then go to the employee because otherwise they're in sort of an unfair position. It's not going to go well. So how do we recruit some champions? So recruiting is the first stage, but when we get to engagement and we get to training, this sounds weird, but you will continue to recruit throughout those two stages because the things you're doing are interesting and people are going to talk, people are going to notice, and you doing those things will continue to recruit, but you need to get a couple of people to start with, and then your program will grow as people hear about it. So the first thing I do is I ask for volunteers. I know it sounds really obvious, but let's say I'm having a lunch and learn, or there's an all staff meeting, I'll ask, can I have five minutes or less? And I'll get up, I'm like, hi, I'm Tanya, I'm from the AppSec team, and I want you to know we are starting like we're starting a security champions program. So those are people and explain briefly what it is and say, if you are interested at all, no obligation, just you know, message me on Teams or Slack or whatever it is that you use and like, let's talk. And some people will message you. Provide opportunities for them to reveal themselves. So I'm gonna just skip down. So like having a lunch and learn or some sort of training or some sort of workshop, whatever it is, people that show up. Some of them might want to be champions. Ask whoever asks questions. So if there's a dev that's always emailing you and asking you stuff, invite them to become a champion. Don't pressure them. Just say, I'm looking for champions and you know, you and I talk a lot and I thought you might be perfect for this. And I wanted to see if you might be interested. It's a little bit like asking someone on a date, but there's way less pressure and there's way less chance of you getting slapped. So if you can use really interesting titles for things, that helps you get um, good things too. So I'm really bad at creating talks, like talk titles. So I remember I had one, it was called Modern Approaches to Application Security and everyone's like, that talk title sucks and it got rejected a bunch of times. And then my friend's like, make it cool. So I was like, purple is the new black, which means nothing. And then I was like, modern approaches to application security underneath as the subtitle. And then it got accepted. I'm like, yes, it's just you need a cool title to get people to show up. And it's so true. And so I am learning this lesson. Um, another thing that I have on this slide is adding to your email signature. I'm looking for security champions. Is this you? Ask me how. So my friend Lucas did this and he found four people emailed him and they're like, what are you talking about? And then two of them became champions. Yeah. Um, another thing that really helps you get the recruitment going is setting up a mantra for your team. So when I first switched to security, you know, I was coming from the dev background and I remember 
immediately we started saying no to lots of things and I was like, oh, okay, I guess that's what we do. But one day I realized that I didn't have to do that and I could say, okay, so doing it that way presents a lot of risk. What if we think of other ways that we could accomplish the same thing but have less risk? Um, if I can do that, are you cool with considering other options? And they're usually like, yeah. And then we would brainstorm. And then we would almost always be able to come up with a better way together. Or sometimes I would say, I need to do some research. Can we meet you know, in two days from now? And they'd be like, okay. And when I started saying, stop saying no. And instead, I literally had a meeting today and I said, it's my job to help you do your job securely. So it's my job to help you and your team. It really diffuses things because that's actually what my job is. And when you have that mantra of I am here to serve you, it really changes the conversation from the beginning. And the, your actions will change when you have that mantra. I have this friend named Ray and he writes this blog called Hella Secure. And he has an article about this and he says his devs are his customers. And when you treat them like that, um, it, it really changes and it sounds weird, but all of a sudden there's people that are interested in becoming security champions. Okay, so like I said, recruitment continues past the recruitment phase. So as we do engagement and as we do the teaching and recognition and rewarding, all of these things, you'll end up getting more volunteers. So if you're like, I only have four champions, but I need 10, try not to freak out and start doing engagement. So engagement, to engage someone is to occupy, attract, or involve them. And I want to do that in security stuff. And the other way that we could talk about engaging is participating or becoming involved with. I want to become involved with them. I want to know what they're working on. I want to know how I can help. Because if I say, is there anything that I can help you with? And they say no the first four times, but the fifth time they're like, actually, there's this thing. Yes. And you can build trust and show them you know stuff <laughs> and help them make more secure choices. Okay, so what can we do to engage software developers? Uh, I got hugely engaged and ridiculously passionate when I was invited on a security incident. I was supposed to just be an observer and I was just like, this is neat. Like they always rushing around and keeping secrets and stuff and I get to, and then there was code and I was like oh I'm reading the code and I'm like oh no this is happening They're like you can just read that and it was actually off skated code but I'm such a big nerd I was like oh this means this and I was like yeah I can and then I wrote a PowerShell script to like de off skate the whole thing and they were really impressed and then I got to join the investigation which was so cool if you have a dev and it is their app involve them in the incident Share appropriate secrets if you can. Make sure you deputize them or explain what need to know is because you don't want them running around telling everyone about this exciting thing they learned. It's very important they don't run around and tell all the secrets. So you have to decide for your organization what's okay to share and what's not. So for instance, I worked in a very, uh, in a above top secret environment doing anti-terrorism uh, anti activities. And I remember Someone tried to let someone in without checking their ID and I, I, yeah, he was like my super senior whatever and I, I tore him a good new one and then I remember these three ladies came up and they're like, oh hey, could you hold the door? I'm like, no, this is a secure facility. You will sign in like everyone else and they're like, oh, well, we're in her when we forgot our pass and I was like, do you think I care? And I was like, this is a top secret facility. There's no way I'm letting you in. So all of you back up away from the door before I open it. And I'm like, also I'm calling security to come talk to you. So don't go anywhere. And then it turned out that they were the super secret people and they're coming to check on us. And I had inadvertently passed a really important test. And I was like, sorry, I was so mouthy. And they're like, no, that was perfect. <laughs> I was pretty embarrassed. But sharing a secret like that is a way to get people interested. I mean, you could share better secrets, but I certainly can't in a live talk. <laughs> um, let your champion see everything first. If there's going to be a policy or you got a cool new tool or you're considering a tool, get them involved in that selection process. Show them, be like, do you like this one? Do you like that one? What do you like the best about it? Because they're going to be using it, right? Anything that you can let them see first helps engage them. Create a mailing list. So I'm big on mailing lists. 
Um, I have an email mailing list, like just for my nerdy stuff, but I mean at work. Like I'll have a lunch and learn list and I'll email them once a month and I'm gonna tell them like, listen, we have this new cheat sheet that we made and we also have a lunch and learn coming up and here's the invite. And then also I wanna tell you that next month we're, we're gonna do this and if anyone wants to volunteer, let me know. And it might sound silly and like they're not like super pretty or anything, I'm not good at that stuff. It's just a bunch, it's a wall of text. But people read it and some of them volunteer and some of them ask questions and I get engagement. More, I like to meet with them once a month. This was my friend Ray again that pointed this out. I didn't realize that I just naturally do that, that I would need to see them once a month. Like I'd always find some excuse to talk to them, but he actually just sets like a one month repeating meeting and just have a list of questions that you always ask so they know they're coming. Like, what are you working on? What are you gonna work on? Like, what can I help you with? You know, do you want me to help you prioritize some of the bugs I see your team having? Like, are you finding false positives with my tools? Have a list of things that you ask ready and you can put an agenda so that they know they're coming. This is a lesson I had to learn um, the hard way. You need to brace yourself. So, so once you build trust with all these awesome intelligent humans where you work, Someone's going to tell you something. So someone's going to say like, hey, Tanya, um, so there's this thing and it's, it's probably nothing. <laughs> it's going to be something bad. And then you find out, you know, there's this team rolling their own crypto. I've definitely had this happen twice. There's a team where they're like, sure, we're putting their SIN number in a URL, but we're base 64 encoding that field first. And like, no one would think to decode that. Shh. Um, and so you need to play it cool because the first time someone I built all this trust and then they told me something or something really bad and then I freaked out and then they didn't want to tell me anything again for a long time. So I've learned to be like, oh yeah, sure. And just like pretend that I'm chill because I don't have a poker face. My poker face is like, um, yeah, so brace yourself for them potentially telling you stuff and try not to freak out on them. I try to let them meet each other because it's awesome if they know each other, then they can help each other, that's good. Um, I invite them to join security communities. So where I used to work, we would walk together to the OWASP meetup. Not always, but some of them would come some months. And when we had the CTF, a bunch of them formed a team. It was really awesome. And no, they did not win first place, but they weren't last place. And I thought that was great because it was their first CTF they'd ever been to. And so, inviting them to like a local b-sides conference because it's free or if you actually work at a place that has money you could invite them to a conference that costs money um just getting them involved in community things can really pique a lot of extra interest and again make them feel engaged so what do we teach our champs right um so there's one key thing that i want you to take away from the teaching thing and then i'm going to tell you lots of stuff because i run a training school <laughs> um, so I'm really big in this topic and I try, I was like, gosh, I have like way more in this one section than the rest of the sections, but I guess I feel really strongly about it, but only teach them what they need to know. Oh my gosh. I have reviewed so much training from other people where I'm like, why are you just like, why is there all this filler? Like, why are you teaching them this random thing that they could search on the internet or like, why are you showing them Shodan? Like Shodan's cool. It has nothing to do with the secure coding course, right? I feel like, or like there, I remember this one trainer, it was like half a day on what is symmetric versus asymmetric encryption and the history of Diffie-Hellman. And they were not writing encryption software. So I'm like, why do they need to know this? Like, please, 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 please stop, 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 stop. Like if it's one extra slide, that's one thing, but I see like a half day out of a two day training where I'm like, this is all filler, just like trash all of this. Another thing that I see people miss is you need to teach them what you need, expect, and want from them as champions. Like if you had a job and there was no job description and there was no like clear stuff that your boss expected from you, would you take that job? No, like you're a security champion. What does that mean? Well, it means that you advocate. What does that mean? Like you need to say like, I need you to triage all the security bugs. I need you to validate these results and I need you to do a code review on every new pull request for secure code review. So I'm gonna give you secure code training 
and then I want you to review every new pull request on behalf of your team and just look for those things on the list I gave you and push it back if it doesn't meet it. And that's, that's what I, and once a month, I wanna have this meeting with you. And if you tell them exactly what you want from them, you are more likely to get a yes. But let's talk about some topics. And so I'm gonna give you like three headline topics and then we're gonna dive into each one of those topics a bit more. So secure coding and architecture or secure design, your policies and tooling. But let's get a bit more. So secure coding and architecture or design, whatever you that person does, because if they are making apps versus designing architecture or bigger things. So formal training is good, but you can give them training too. I know I run a training company and you're like, look at her, she's doing public speaking right now. But I want to tell you that I I was so bad at it when I started. It was really, my first talk was not good. I would say I got really good by my 50th one. And so you can learn too, trust me. Um, so I am a big fan of threat modeling. So if someone's gonna be designing things, I want them to know at least the basics of threat modeling. Security architecture, so like whiteboarding out what's gonna happen and it's like, is this a problem? Is this a good idea, etc. Code review, if they are a person that proves code, want them to review it. How to fix popular bugs or where to find the answer. You don't have to teach them how to fix every bug. You need to teach them how to find the answer to fixing the bug. I think that we need to repeat technical training once a year. Why? Because people leave and new people join and things change and people forget. Your policies. I know you're like, that's boring. I agree. Reading policies on the internet, you know, like white background, black text. That is not my idea of a great time. So I am a big fan of teaching the policies instead. So here for people who want to read the thing, and for people who don't want to, I'm gonna have a meeting and I'm gonna lively tell you why we are doing this thing and why we need your help. So only talk to them about the policies or standards or guidelines that actually apply to them and doing their job. Don't teach them a ton of crap that they don't need to know. Help them create guidelines that are missing. So uh, one of my clients, they're like, yeah, a bunch of our devs are gonna do serverless. So we came up with a serverless best practices guide of what we were hoping to see from them and gave that to them. They're like, oh, cool, thanks. Whenever there's documentation missing, try to help them create it. Even if it's just a one pager with some best practices or known things that often go wrong, say, so just wanted to give you a heads up about this. Like just you doing that effort shows that you're there and shows that you wanna be involved. And also, I mean, that document might save your butt, right? If they follow those best practices, you might be avoiding so many things you don't even think about. Like in Brian's talk earlier, when he was talking about, you know, design flaws and how that's a vague topic, it's like, it is, but it, it makes up a huge percentage of what's wrong with applications and why they're insecure. And it's a really valid conversation I always want to have. Um, teach them how to be compliant with your policies and help them get there. Whenever I create a new secure coding guideline, I've ended up finding out that there'll be some devs that are worried they're going to get fired or worried because they support a bunch of legacy apps. They're like, how am I ever going to have the time to fix those? It's like, I'm going to help you. We're going to come up with a plan and this might mean we hire a consultant to fix those bugs. It might mean, you know, I loan you a champion from another team and there's some sort of job shadow thing happen. Um, there's a lot of options for things, but I want everyone to know, like, no one's getting fired. This policy is not a stick I'm going to run around and use so that I can fire people I don't like. It's, it's a level that I want us to all move towards being at so that I can sleep at night and not all my hair is gray from working here. Um, I believe that every software developer and technical person should be briefed on what their role is during a security incident. I have had software developers, help desk, operations folks try their best to help and ruin the chain of custody. I've had them make all... I went to the dentist one day, so I showed up late and all the executives were basically just running around screaming, the sky is falling. And it was because a help desk person who had never been briefed on what to do during an incident had tried to manage an incident themselves and had told all the executives that one of our buildings was infected with malware, even though the building was a dumb building and it was made of concrete and concrete doesn't get malware. 
and it turned out it was just a lot of Canadians watching the Olympics and it was figure skating and we really dig that here and it was just like lots of people watching the Olympics from their desk that's all it was and if that help desk person had known when they should pass it over and what their role is during an incident I wouldn't have had a whole bunch of executives talking in the elevator telling everyone else how one of our buildings had caught malware it took me weeks to get everyone to stop saying that and explain over and over again seriously concrete can't anyway cannot get malware um, I'm a big fan of job shadowing so it's like I'm gonna do you know code review all day on this does anyone want to join me um, so I know some people are like that sounds really boring but um, I dig it so there um, and I am a big fan of holding consultations so if I'm gonna write a new secure coding guideline I want everyone's opinion you know I've created a cheat sheet this is draft one tell me how you feel what do you think I want to know and then I adjust because guess what all those devs are smart that's why they're not our ex dev <laughs> that's why they still work for us because they're smart okay tooling so if you have tools you expect them to use you want to know they're doing it safely so I like to give my own training on the tools I want them to use again you're like Tanya makes training professionally but I did not always I assure you my first training was not the best I was like we're all gonna click here we're gonna click the default don't touch anything else I don't know what will happen <laughs> and I was like don't touch this button it's very dangerous <laughs> but I'm better at it now and the message got across because my first champions program all I wanted them to do was scan it with zap scan with all the default settings and just fix the highs and criticals that's it that's all I need from you just please do that because I am the only pen tester for all zillion of you and if you could just not send me things that are blazingly on fire that would be great can zap do way more than that yes it can but it was enough training that all the devs could do it and stuff started showing up on my desk and it was a lot nicer to look at. I want the devs to know what the output means from my tools. I don't want it to be a mystery. I don't want them to receive it and ask if it's in English or not. <laughs> um, if I am expecting them to handle the output directly, I need to teach them how to validate those results because I don't want them chasing false positives. So I want to give some lessons on that. If I am expecting them to install the tools, so sometimes you can install things for them, but quite often, you know, they're creating pipelines, they're off, they're being devs, they're creating and building and doing all the stuff all the time. And so I might say, okay, so like, here's how to install it. And here's the settings I want to see, like go forth and conquer now. I always want to be a part of helping them select the best tools. If they will allow me to be part of that conversation, I definitely want to be. Um, and I like to do lunch and learns or hackathons or workshops or whatever it is. It doesn't need to be perfect. It doesn't need to be amazing. It doesn't need to be OWASP global AppSec worthy. It just needs to be worthy of their time. And you just show them the things you really need them to do. And so um, I briefly want to talk about coaching, which is a style of teaching. If you are not good in front of an audience, which I, I was I was really terrified when I started doing public speaking. I really was. I was terrified. Um, and it took me a while, so I did coaching instead a lot. And it turns out like a mix works really well for me. And so coaching is a, so, so the kitty has a lifesaver because it's powerful. So the, like, I thought that they looked like a Jedi, but they needed a lifesaver to make that clear. But anyway, so let's talk about how about what coaching means and then how you could do some. So you don't have to stand up in front of all of your peers and say stuff. You could do this instead. So coaching means, formal definition again, enabling individuals and teams to achieve their full potential. It means basically helping them make real lasting change, right? And what we want these people to change is their opinion and viewpoint and knowledge on security. I want security to be extremely important to my champions. I want them to be interested in it. I want them to take it seriously and that will emanate to the rest of the team. That's really important to me. So if we want them to start practicing a secure system development life cycle, we need to support them in getting there. And if we want them to sing our, the praises of security, we need to constantly reinforce those values with them. And coaching is a way where you get many touch points, 
versus you know standing up in front of a crowd with a lot of people. And so what can we, how can we do some coaching? So for champions specifically, set up office hours. You know, every Thursday from two to four, I have office hours and my Zoom or my Teams meeting or whatever is just open. I'm always there. It's an open invitation for anyone to come and talk to me about security. Set up repeat meetings with each one of your champions each month. And um, like I said, that was my friend Ray's idea, but it didn't occur to me that I would go talk to them all at least once per month. And when, he, when I read it in his article, I was like, oh my gosh, that's so true. And you could just set up a meeting to make sure it happens instead of having to think about going to talk to them. Help them prioritize, because it can be overwhelming. I, one of my clients scanned something that they had acquired and it had 43,000 vulnerabilities. And I don't know about you, but I found that overwhelming. And so instead I'm like, okay, so actually there's two types of vulnerabilities that I want them to do. And it's like a copy paste fix. And so I want to talk to them about the two bugs I need them to fix. There just happens to be 101 instances in total. And then it was less scary. Whenever you can be available for your champions, they are important to you and you should be important to them. And if you don't make time for them, they will feel that and they'll stop asking you and then bad things happen. Um, I like to help them set goals and then help them achieve those goals and sometimes helping them achieve it is just asking them once a week, hey, did you get that thing working yet? Do you need me to come help? Oh, no, you don't need me to? Okay. And then a week later, hey, did you get that thing working? Oh, do you need my help? Okay, I'll be there later. <laughs> um, teach them specific skills or tools. I like to basically ask them what they need or what they want and then try to help them do it. And so maybe they're like, you know what, one day I'm hoping eventually to be an offensive security engineer or one day, you know, I'm hoping to be a CISO or whatever their thing is. If there's ways that you can help enable them in doing that thing, or maybe they want to be a, a software architect someday. And so learning all the threat modeling and security architecture will help them be awesome at that. And so enable them and basically you win and they win and your organization wins. Briefly, I want to talk about delegation. I didn't know where to put this slide in. This really isn't in the teaching section, but I was like, it needs to be in this presentation. So I'm just going to give her some things you should not do. Even if you know how you're like, I know how to fix. I know how to fix that security bug. Yeah, I know you know how, but there's one of you and there's 500 of them and you don't have time to fix every bug. It doesn't mean you should never fix bugs. I'm telling you that sometimes you got to delegate. If someone's going to update a framework, is that really your job? Pl planning releases and upgrades? I don't feel that's our business. Like assigning who does what, running every single scan, implementing, right? Like there's lots of things that just aren't our job and there's going to be too much work for you. And so this is the type of stuff that maybe you want to delegate your awesome champions. And maybe at first you do it with them. You have a session and together you review those responses and requests and go through and see the problem together, but eventually you want them to do it on their own. Things not to delegate. This is really important. Some things should not be delegated. I, I remember some of my friends, they're like, oh, that person is the delegator. I'm like, what does that mean? They're like, they delegate their entire job. Like, I literally don't know what they do all day. They literally delegate 100% of their work. And I was like, oh, that person's smart. <laughs> but some things should not be delegated. So, if you have a SAS tool, static application security testing tool, until you have given training to your devs how to validate that stuff, you should be validating it. You, you got to give them training and work with them. I've seen so many companies that get a SAS tool, they're like, yeah, you deal with it. And then it, the SAS tool gets like unplugged and no one's using it and you're paying a lot of money for nothing. Those tools are powerful and amazing. But if you don't give training to your devs, you're going to get bad results. Giving security security's approval on literally anything. No approvals unless they're from you. I'm um, using a new tool without training, training other champions. We are looking for partnership and assistance, not replacement. I have seen it where people go a bit too far and delegate a hundred, like way too much. And you don't want that because then they don't need you anymore, but also bad things can happen. Okay. So the next two are recognition and rewards. And so I'm doing both because you should do both. So I am the type of person that really enjoys recognition. So if someone tells my boss I did a good job and then my boss is like, pat, pat, I am overjoyed. I am so 
that person. Someone like put a gold star on something, I'd be like, yes! Versus someone's like, oh, we're going to give you a $50 gift certificate to like some restaurant. I'm like, yeah, I have money. I can eat there if I want to. For me, that's not as big of a reward as my peers or my boss knowing and expressing, like knowing I did a good job expressing gratitude toward that. So I am in the recognized category, but a lot of people aren't. A lot of them are in the reward category. So we have to talk about both and you need to do both. So it is important to recognize your champions. We want them to know they're doing a good job. And we do not want them to feel like they are doing two jobs and they're getting one paycheck. We want them to know we are grateful, we appreciate them. We don't want them to feel like this kitty where they're just squish, squish, squished and not appreciated. So how can we recognize them? It sounds so silly, but like literally right above me, I have two little certificates that people made for me and I was like, well, obviously I'm going to put them on the wall. I was all excited. <laughs> um, recognize them in front of their peers. So this could mean having a special virtual background for security champions or putting a star next to their name in Slack or Teams. Doing something visual that makes it clear that person is a champion. Always put a note in their performance review to thank them for doing this work on top of their regular job. Always do that. Tell their boss every single time they do something big. Like, yeah, a couple weeks ago, Brad told me that there was this team, he'd been you know, to this developer lunch and this team was talking about how they'd rolled their own crypto and he told me about it and I went and approached that team and asked them to do a secure review and then I stumbled upon the thing that Brad told me about and then I was able to course correct and now they're doing proper encryption. And without Brad, I wouldn't have known you know, in the security architecture thing, they had marked it as encryption. And it would have taken a while for us to figure that out. And it might have been when we had an incident. And so I am so happy that Brad told me about this and trusted me with this information to know I would handle it well and not make him look like a snitch in front of his team when really what he's doing is the right thing and trying to fix a security problem, right? Um, sending them an email and telling them that you noticed that they did something good. So if it's a thing they already told you about in the meeting, you don't need to email them after and be like, I noticed that, but let's say, you know, someone's like, yeah, Brad was telling me, you know, that I should talk to you about this. Yes, thank you. Write them a message and say thank you for their help. These little things make a huge difference. Um, one more thing is if you can make it clear in front of their peers that their role matters and like what their role is, Again, this makes people feel good. Like, I like it. Okay, so rewarding them. So I'm a big fan of rewarding good behavior instead of attempting to punish bad behavior. And I like to reward whatever I can. I remember I had an employee and they had messed up very, very, very badly. And I was very upset with them. And I remember saying, I don't need to punish you because I know you're going to punish yourself way more than I ever would. So tomorrow, when you've cooled down, let's have a discussion about how this can never happen again. And the employee was just like, I am going to punish myself, aren't I? And I'm like, I'm not telling you to. I just know that's what you're going to do. So I'm not going to tell you all my thoughts because you already know. And let's try to talk about good behavior and what they could do better next time. And so let's reward anything that we can reasonably. So I'm a big fan of the double dip, so I'm rewarding them, but I'm also reinforcing security stuff, so let's get them security gifts, training, permission to go like leave work early to attend something, books, videos, CTFs, whatever it is, a YubiKey. I've seen a lot of places where if someone did something good, they got a YubiKey for personal use. It's like, yes, they're doing MFA at home too giving them your time and undivided attention. When someone comes to your desk, turning your body like this and facing them and looking at them, put down your damn phone and look in their eyes and talk to them and listen. This will make an impression, trust me. Help them with more than just security. I know a lot of security engineers were short on time, but if this is a person that's a good champion and they're like, yeah, I'm just like really stuck on this thing or, you know, I applied for a promotion or I'm applying and like I had to write like this letter. I'm like, want me to proofread it? I'm like, good at this. I've been doing tech forever. Like, really? Yeah, of course I will. It's going to take 10 minutes. Those little things make them feel good and valued. Let them help you make decisions. Let them see a new tool first. Anything that you can think of to let them know how valuable they are to you. 
do those things. Okay, last one, the hardest one, don't stop. So when in doubt, over communicate. If you do not communicate regularly, your program is going to disappear way faster than you think. Most often when I'm called in to consult, it's like, well, in 2019, we were doing blah, blah. And then, um, and then we stopped for a few months and then now it's two years ago. And so let's, you know, what are we going to do with our program? I'm like, well, you don't really have a program. So let's, let's try to, you know, start again and let's not sprint. Let's marathon this. Let's plan out s slow and steady. So ways that we can do this, consistency. And consistency means planning in advance. Even if you only meet with them once a month, so there's no education, there's no lunch and learns, there's no big deals or anything. It's just, you're just checking in and you're like, hey, I wanted to check in with you and see if you need any help with anything. What have you been working on lately? Is there anything there for me? Do you need introductions to people on other teams? Let me know, I'm here. It sounds, and sometimes they'll be like, yeah, everything's good. Can I just, can I just talk to you next month? Sure, right? Because they're busy and frantic or whatever, because they actually have a full-time job that they're busy doing. But just the fact that you checked in lets them know your program still exists. Some champions are gonna need more of your time than others, and some champions are gonna be better than others. Some people will do the bare minimum because that's who they are. And guess what that is? Way better than nothing. If you accidentally drop your program, pick it up as soon as you can. Even if it's just an email to tell them that next month you're going to have a lunch and learn and you actually have nothing planned, you have a whole month to, to get ready. <laughs> um, culture is a practice, just like yoga. You don't do yoga once and then two years later you're like, why can't I touch my toes? You have to practice over and over and over and over and that is the same with us. It will fall apart faster than you think if you do not continue to touch base and continue to make sure they know you are there. So this is the recipe we followed and we did it and we're awesome and the stick figure people are high-fiving. Yes, I love this picture. <laughs> so let me conclude and then we're going to do some Q&A. So conclude, well, and then I'm going to give you resources, then we're going to do Q&A. So what did we learn? So we learned how to attract the right people and that's in the recruiting phase, the engagement phase, and the teaching phase. We talked about what to teach them and what not to teach them and different ways you can teach. How to engage them and make them interested and turn them into your advocate so they are on your side. What to delegate and some things we should probably not delegate. How to make them feel motivated, so rewarding and recognizing them, which are not the same thing and we have to do both because you cannot tell by looking which one is which. And basically we talked about how to build a really amazing security champion program. So again, the recipe for the 4,000th time, but if you wanted to take a screenshot of a slide, this might be a good one. But let's see some free resources. And then, and then Jackie's gonna come back on. So there's some resources. So the first one is I have an online community that is free. So there's live streaming events, there's articles, there's chat rooms. And sometimes we just hang out and talk about cool books we like. But community.wehackpurple.com, totally free. We don't sell stuff inside the community. It's just a hangout space because I wanted to hang out there. My business is like, what? we don't really make money off this. I'm like, I know, but I get to hang out there and it makes me really happy. So we're going to keep doing it. <laughs> um, these books are not free. But um, I, so obviously I think my book's amazing. That's Alice and Bob Learn Application Security, but all of these books are awesome. I believe DevOps is the way forward in making excellent, rugged software that is secure. And so there's the DevOps handbooks, the Phoenix Project, Accelerate, the Unicorn Project, plus Alice and Bob Learn. These are all books that can really help you basically be more awesome. I have a podcast, we currently have a break, um, but season two is just going to be tips and tricks about all these things you can do to just do security better, as well as interviews with cool people that I meet. Um, oh, and it's called We Hack Purple Podcast. I'm really bad at saying that. And it, it's on YouTube, but it's also on podcast um, platforms like Podcast Addict and Apple. Um, resources me. So I am a giant nerd and I'm She Hacks Purple on every platform you can think of. 
So I also have a blog, so I've been putting it on my company's site, zoehackpurple.com slash blogs. And right now I am blogging about Security Champions. So I've taken this talk and just sussed out so much more. I'm giving examples of programs and other things you can do because they only let you talk so long at conferences, but I had so much more to say. Um, Alice and Bob, newsletter, etc. I have a lot of stuff. But for now, I want to hope that you spend your life doing strange things with weird people because I think that is the best way to spend your time. And I want to say thank you so much. Thank you to OWASP for having me at this amazing conference. AppSec is my favorite conference and they, they know that. I am their biggest fangirl. And thank you for coming to my talk. I really appreciate it. I happen to know there were a bunch of other really awesome talks during this time slot. So thank you for picking me. But just so you know, the other talks are recorded because I asked them because I wanted to see their talks. Thank you.